the things that's been on my mind recently was actually sparked from a email that you sent to our team a couple of weeks ago uh, about survivor's guilt. And you had shared that it had come up in one of your coaching situations, in one of your coaching conversations. And, uh, and actually just recently in the past week, I had a conversation on a similar topic, not exactly the same, but a similar topic. And then I was sort of thinking about my own experience, uh, especially recently in this pandemic, you know, as we're recording here, we're in the middle of a global pandemic and there's been a real bifurcation in how people have experienced the last nine months. You know, there's people who have suffered a lot and health crises and have had you know serious consequences economically and then there's a whole other group of people who have really been thriving actually during this pandemic they've been able to spend more time at home and uh more time with their families less time commuting less time in the office and you know there are certain industries that are actually doing really well as a result of some of the economic changes that have taken place and i think and i would count myself as one of those people there's a big section of those people who actually feel really guilty about having done pretty well while large sections of the population are not doing so well. And so uh, I was hoping we could have a conversation about this and survivor's guilt and we can see where it takes us. To broadly understand what survivor's guilt is, is uh, if you um, if you have been involved in an accident, for example, and one person is very se severely injured or dies and the other person um, escapes with minor injuries, then the person who escaped with minor injuries can actually feel like, well, I don't deserve to live because we were in the same circumstance. Why should this person who was with me experience so much pain and I not experience pain? So uh, part of the way of experiencing the pain is by keeping the guilt alive. So, so that way I don't escape, I, I, so that I never escape the pain of what the other person experienced. And I need to keep that alive for myself because then I can feel justified in living my own life. What happens is, so every form of guilt is actually giving us something, right? Just like any emotion actually gives us something. It's so important to understand, like um, Gabor Mate, who is, if you have seen his TED talk on the, 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 the power of addiction and the addiction to power, very popular TED talk. He talks about uh, how uh, every addiction, uh, not just substance abuse, but uh, every form of addiction, whether it's power, it's money, um, before we understand what's wrong about it, it's important to understand what is it giving us. Mm -hmm. And so when we understand what is this guilt giving us, taking us back to the survivor's guilt, it gives us some amount of justification for actually living our life. Um, so that the idea here is that um, if I can feel guilty enough and I suffer through the guilt, at least I at least there is some uh, compensation that I'm making for the fact that I'm still alive. Mm -hmm. right. So uh, it's something, it's, uh, guilt, has a, guilt has a purpose. Uh, it's prodding us to, uh, to do something. Now, when it's, when it's a little unhealthy, the, the purpose of the guilt is some sort of justification. And it's important here, what am I trying to justify? Um, and to unpack that and understand that uh, clearly, because that justification sometimes may not be necessary. Um, that we could, even when somebody else has received less and I have received more in the same circumstance, uh, that I can choose to give out of, uh, genuine um, compassion, not because I'm better, but because um, I genuinely feel that somebody else is suffering. 
Um, right. So, so again, understanding why the guilt exists. What is that guilt actually giving me in this circumstance? Um, and to unpack that and clearly understand that would be very helpful in this regard. So I, um, after you shared that email, I did a little bit of um, research on survivor's guilt. And just as, as, as an aside, it was something that was pretty common after the Holocaust and 9-11 and other kind of big traumatic events where, you know, swaths of people did not survive and, and swaths of people actually yeah. did survive. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is um, the, the internal family systems framework, mm -hmm. which, you know, for, for people who might not know, is sort of looking at yourself as a self in the center, but with lots of parts that are also a part of you. They might not be part of the core self, but they are a part of you. And, you know, some of those parts might be a super ambitious part. Some of those parts might be uh, a part that has a lot of self doubt or another part that gets really angry at people. And one of the ways to actually deal with the parts, um, and this is definitely espoused by the, uh, by the, uh, people who started the the the, the framework, um, this guy named Schwartz, which is that uh, we actually need to hear the parts and we need to see the positive intent of the parts. Right. And so, as you were speaking, you know, I was just thinking the guilt that we're feeling before trying to get rid of it. We actually need to, like you said, use it as data. What is it telling me? Um, and that's that this situation is difficult and it was a very traumatic situation and maybe I do need to listen to it because that can help me with some sort of empathy and actually experience my own suffering so that, you know, it's, it's impossible to actually experience somebody else's suffering, but we actually need to tap into our own suffering before feeling that suffering. And so this strikes me as kind of a first entrance to be able to do that. That, that's uh, that's exceedingly powerful. Also, um, along those same lines, guilt um, can be uh, can be a protective mechanism too. And as an example, uh, I feel like when I feel guilty, I, it prods me to act in a specific way and to compensate for uh, what I have and what somebody else doesn't have. Now, what uh, what what we might discover when we sit with our own guilt is that uh, there is a sense of grief that I haven't actually dealt with. And when the pandemic first came out, I think it was, um, um, it was in the Harvard Business Review, uh, I'm forgetting, but there was a very powerful article on, on grief and how um, we are not truly grieving our situation and we are trying to address it or act or compensate for it in some way without fully understanding how it's truly affecting us deep down. Mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of us feel helpless um, and um, we are not used. Um, our egos um, don't like the feeling of being helpless. Now, some of us may also say, oh, the helplessness is a defeatist idea. Um, it's also a way to escape responsibility. But even when we feel responsible, um, sometimes we may not be able to do enough to actually solve somebody else's suffering. And so there is a certain part of us that feels extremely sad. And uh, the ego hates the feeling of helplessness. So at that point in time, um, it's, its way of boosting itself up is by using guilt as a means of saying, well, because you're helpless and the other person is suffering and you're not able to solve for it, then you, you need to suffer <laughs> just like the other person is suffering. And that's how many times when you keep the guilt alive, there is, a, there is a sense that I am suffering with the other person. And so 
and I am allowed to live. This is uh, this is so helpful because when you first started mentioning, you know, grieving, um, you know, I'm thinking, well, I don't have that much to grieve. Actually, things are going well. That's why we're having this conversation in the first place. And then that's exactly it. Helplessness. It's like so helpless and I don't want to feel that because it feels so deflating. It feels so the opposite of energizing and it's so contrary to how I usually feel. Right. So this feeling of guilt is actually energizing. It's not healthy, but it's, it is, it, it does numb that feeling of helplessness and it's giving me something just like those parts of us, even though they might be extremely unhealthy, they're actually giving us something which in its pure form is really well intentioned. And that's, it doesn't want me to feel crappy <laughs> and that's kind of nice. But as it gets refracted, it comes out in all sorts of unhealthy ways. And I really see that. So, you're absolutely right. And, and so now, uh, the challenge now, the layers of complexity in all of this is, uh, is very interesting. So, so for some of us who feel helpless, um, we also feel helpless about the fact that I'm not feeling pained enough <laughs> by, somebody else's, by somebody else's misery. It's interesting how, well, I, when things are going well for me, and then somebody else, things are not going so well. Uh, I say, well, I feel bad for the other person. But what I am sometimes saying is, I actually don't even feel as bad as I should be feeling. And then there is a guilt that arises because of that. <laughs> um, now, again, that guilt has a certain purpose. It's actually trying to point to the fact that, okay, how deep, does, how deep does your compassion run? How deep does your empathy run? Mm -hmm. And because of our lifestyle and how sometimes in our process of achieving, we have abandoned our heart, it's pointing to the fact that our hearts may not be as alive. Mm -hmm. And then I'm sitting and thinking, oh man, I should feel, I should feel something here, but I'm not feeling that. And I feel really terrible about the fact that I'm not feeling that. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are so many layers of complexity here with uh, where and what we are actually experiencing guilt about. And we can also project that guilt outwards in ways that can be compensating, but not exactly solving what's happening. One of those, one of those things that strikes me is blaming people in power who because we're right, people in power haven't handled things as great as they could have. Right. Um, so we're not wrong and we kind of hang our hats on the fact that we're not wrong. Um, but there's also something that we're missing there and yes. that's taking our own responsibility and I think a lot of us want, and again, I'll count myself in this, is we want to have the right, we want to have a perfect amount of compassion to sort of be a good person for others to think of ourselves as good people so that, but maybe most importantly, so that we can think of ourselves as, as good people. But, and depending on personality type, this can vary a little bit, but, but not too much compassion where it gets in the way of us Pursuing our ambitions. <laughs> exactly, doing our thing in the world, whatever that thing might be. Um, you know, I don't want to get stuck in like feeling so much empathy and so much compassion for others, especially with problems that are so huge that I know I'm not going to solve. So I know I'm not actually going to get to a place where it's going to feel fully satisfying. Right. In, in order for me to make a difference, I'm gonna have to just pretty much experience discomfort the entire time. And if I'm not experiencing the discomfort, I'm probably doing it wrong. And so we're smart enough to recognize that. And so we just really limit the amount of compassion and empathy that we actually feel. Yeah, so true. Um, 
so this is why understanding what that guilt is actually pointing towards becomes even more important. Uh, sometimes it's pointing towards the fact that we have refused to accept in a healthy way our own helplessness. Um, and uh, one of the reasons why it's so hard to come to that place is yes, we don't like to feel helpless. The second thing, we also feel that being in that situation makes us um, complacent, resigned, um, um, shifting the responsibility extra. The idea of healthy grief is not complacency. It's, uh, it's the acknowledgement that life puts us all in circumstances where uh, we realize we have absolutely no control. And if we are able to own that in a very healthy way, that guilt actually transforms itself into humility, where we truly recognize how helpless we are in the face of certain things, and at the same time, don't stop doing what is necessary for us to do. But when we do that <laughs> from a place of genuine humility, we don't feel morally superior. <laughs> we actually feel that as helpless. And at the same time, we know we need to do our part. But even in our doing our part may not necessarily solve uh, what, what we are seeing happen. Um, and that humility, that kind of humility, the ego is not used to. Mm -hmm. We are we are used to a kind of humility that's that aim that that gets some recognition, that that then gives us a sense of pro provision, that gives us uh, <laughs> also a sense of moral superiority, mm -hmm. and I don't know how we call that humility, but the experience of humility is a sense that. That it has helplessness and empowerment simultaneously in it. Again, again, the ego doesn't understand that because the ego only knows one thing or the other. But it doesn't really know both. Um, and uh, that's what healthy grieving, that's what a healthy feeling of um, uh, accepting our helplessness gives us. <clears throat> Uh, Jerry Colonna, who is a man and a coach that I know both of us really respect, uh, <laughs> talks about the tragic gap, um, a, a place where we need to stand, where he says we're called to stand between where we are in this moment and what we know is possible. And as you're speaking about standing in this place between humility and empowerment, it, 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 rings true it, it it feels very similar to standing in this in this tragic gap that that's actually really uncomfortable because yes. of what you laid out about how the ego is not used to it and it will require something different from the paradigm that we've been in our whole lives again i i think um the reason why so we all experience tragic gaps in our, in our lives. Every single person does. Um, we have chosen to cope with it in specific ways. And so over time, some of us may feel that more and some of us may feel that less, but we all have those gaps. Um, the challenge when we do encounter those gaps is that um, uh, depend on, depending on, and the ego is fragile by nature. It, the, the, you, when we really understand the fragility of the ego, and this pandemic has actually really brought that to the fore of how fragile our egos are. Part of, which, part of it is because we have never really learned how to live in the tragic space in a dignified fashion, mm -hmm. uh, which takes work, which takes a lot of inner work. Uh, the fragile ego then reacts. Uh, and part of that reaction, one way in which the fragile ego reacts is, uh, is guilt and prodding us to act on that, which then um, externally speaking may seem like we are helping someone. 
but internally speaking, it's the ego's desire to just stay alive. Uh, that's that. And so when we, when we look at that very clearly and understand what exactly is happening, then one is we choose to stay in that tragic gap. We choose to stay in that place of helplessness uh, because that's what we are being called to do at this point. And at the same time, not use that as an excuse to not act. Uh, but then also letting the action, and this is also something very common, commonly experienced, um, uh, letting the action um, over time do what it's meant to do, do what it's meant, do let the action impact the world in a way that it's meant to impact and not put an extra pressure on it to be this big, this large, this, you know, well, uh, if I am truly helping somebody, then, you know, this is how they must feel. Because ultimately, all of that is just uh, our own way of making ourselves feel better. So uh, let's, let's just call it out here. And I think there's large groups of people who are, and again, I'll include myself in this, who go through the thought process. This is really tough. What can I do? Okay, I'll make a donation. That will be the thing I will be able to feel better about myself. It won't require too much effort. And, um, and then I've done my part. What, for the person who has that thought process, we don't want to discourage them from actually being generous and from sharing. There's, there's, the amount of authenticity can be very tremendously and, and, and generosity can vary tremendously by person, but we certainly don't want to discourage those kind of behaviors because there's always at least an ounce of authenticity and generosity in there. So what, um, how should that person start thinking about their own behaviors and, and possibly what's, what's possible for them as they move forward? Thank you, thank you. That's a, that's, that's a very powerful question. Uh, one of the things that I've recognized over time is that generosity is not just an act, it's a, it's a state of mind. Uh, and many times we try to reduce the fact that we can't experience the state of mind. Again, it's compensation. We try to reduce that to one act. <laughs> and then that act gives us the sense that we are generous. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, what's important for us is to reframe that, uh, how we look at generosity. Um, and while just like care, when we say care is a verb and care is a noun, um, um, love is a verb and love is a noun. The idea is that there is an act uh, and there is a state of mind. Uh, and the idea here is how do we, how do we, uh, how, one, how does the act come from the state of mind? That's number one. And number two, how do we preserve that state of mind? so that everything that we do is coming from that place, mm. right? And the challenge with a generous act, like giving a donation, maybe sometimes a way to just reduce the frame of mind to an act and then feel okay with not feeling that state of mind every time. I'm trying to think back now on times that I've made a donation and just like, how do I feel five seconds after hitting the button to make the donation? And then five minutes after hitting the donate button and then five hours and five days and five weeks and five months. And yeah, that would be a real fascinating thing to actually have a, but I, I fear that it might, I, be, I, I think I'm in a very different space, five months, like it's just a lot less meaningful to me because my ego has gotten what it wanted in that moment. Exactly. And, but, but it, if it were really purely about the mindset and the positive 
the, the possible positive effects of that, that should stay with me longer and should, should, should be there. Yeah. Much more consistently. So that's really a very interesting exercise to go through. So again, the idea of generosity is um, uh, one thing to practice effectively would be uh, not making generosity an act of charity, giving to someone who is sufficiently distanced from us. But generosity is an act uh, that we can uh, do even with people who are close by, who sometimes we actually are not very generous with. Mm -hmm. uh, Again, it's a state of mind. Um, it's, um, it's, uh, we are all in some way or form poverty stricken. <laughs> Even the richest people sometimes feel the dearth of having genuine connection, love um, in their lives. So it's not just when we look at, when we look at, well, who does not have and who has, Sometimes it can be a very superficial way of looking at it when we simply think about money or hunger. Um, and you know the famous Mother Teresa quote about how she sees more poverty in the in the beautifully decorated apartments in Fifth Avenue than on the streets of Kolkata is true. <laughs> um, we are all in some way or form poor. Um, and so the act of generosity is recognizing what this person needs at this time. That's what empathy is. Um, and being able to give that. And sometimes recognizing that we are not in the place to give, <laughs> which actually <laughs> brings us in touch with our own poverty. <laughs> right. One of the things that um, Brene Brown uh, does often is in her, I, I believe it's in her workshops, um, and she speaks about this on her own podcast, is, is, um, is asking people to feel empathy for people who have never had a, or, or to feel empathy for people who are going through something that they've never gone through. And most people find it difficult very early on to give empathy for that person. But then when she asks, you know, who in their life has felt uh, in a, you know, who has had experienced an extremely challenging situation or who has grieved the loss of somebody close in their life who have had an injury or been um, prohibited from doing something in some way. And everyone has had those experiences. And so through touching your own suffering by actually thinking about, you know, in very specific ways that you suffered, it's actually possible to have empathy. Yeah, exactly. And then also recognizing, and this is a very, um, hopefully this actually creates more humility, that some people have experienced much more than I have. <laughs> and the ego wants to feel like it has experienced it all and knows everything about everything. But there is humility in recognizing, you know what, I don't have certain experiences. Of course, that brings this whole notion of like, well, I'm privileged. Um, but there is a humility in that privilege in the sense that, yes, I have, and in that having, then I don't have the experience of what it needs, <laughs> right? So, so that itself can actually bring a certain level of humility. So instead of feeling guilty, then we learn how to transform that guilt into um, a uh, sense of humility, S learning how to stay in that gap. And at the same time, acting from that place of humility, that's when we actually experience the empowerment. And this uh, feels like we're coming back full circle a little bit here because alongside that humility, the way that you're describing it also allows us to feel real gratitude for actually being in a fortunate situation, not some faux gratitude where we're able to feel gratitude, talk about our gratitude, and that be a way to one up everybody else. Because I'm in a, I'm in such a privileged position that I can feel gratitude, and I'm so self aware that I'll actually tell you about my gratitude. <laughs> and also, sometimes gratitude can be, oh wow, I'm glad I'm not in that situation. Uh huh. 
uh, and then accompanying that gratitude can also be like, well, that also means I never really fully understand what it means to be in that situation, <laughs> right? Uh, because then I am short of really being able to provide true understanding for what somebody in that situation is actually experiencing because I've never gone through it. Um, so along with that gratitude, um, um, there is also an experience of like, yeah, I, I don't know what it feels like. It's, it's humbling. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, uh, again, um, that is a very grounding experience. So in that place, even if we have to give to the other person, we give not because we are better. <laughs> we give because we have, and at the same time, we give because sometimes we don't understand what it means to be in that situation. <laughs> and uh, we give from that place of humility, <laughs> and not as a way of helping the ego um, feel good about itself. Mm. And perpetuating its existence. And we, we also, uh, we give from a place of having allowed our own gratitude to really enter our own hearts, yep. rather than it being a concept. It's actually something that somatically we can feel and experience. And I've noticed this in my own um, gratitude journaling, and this is something that we've talked about before, but the tendency to say, you know, I'm feeling really grateful for putting a bunch of food on the table or for the food that's on my table, but really we mean that I'm just grateful that I was so awesome that I could afford this beautiful food or that, you know, my, uh, I was able to hire somebody to cook this amazing food. Yeah. Uh, and so there's a subtle difference. We might be saying the same words. I'm really grateful for this food or for, you know, the opportunity to do this amazing work. But the question is like, where is my heart yeah. in those statements? And am, is this just a way of proving with the ego that I'm great or is, am I really experiencing that gratitude? And I think from that place, our generosity and our empathy and our experience of other people and, you know, what we might be going through versus what somebody else might be going through, even if our circumstances are very fortunate and somebody else's are not, it's just different. It's got a different quality. Completely agree with it, 100%. So unpack what's behind the guilt uh, without reacting. And uh, we will find a treasure trove of um, what we need to really understand and learn. And most importantly, we'll come in touch with our hearts, genuinely come in touch with our hearts. Uh, and from that place, then we act. Um, it's a very different experience. Well, I knew I was excited for this conversation and uh, I'm so happy with what we were able to talk about here today. It feels so satisfying. And uh, again, yeah, thank you for your insights and your wisdom and just happy to be connected to you. Likewise, thank you.